All right there. My father died when I was 16 years old. It was uh, very surprising. He was a relatively healthy man. I think he was 53, 54. And he got quite sick and no one knew what it was. He went to hospital, they gave him some drugs. He came out of hospital, slept downstairs a lot of puking, no real movement, went back to hospital, a couple of weeks later, dead. And they said he had some kind of virus, but it was at the sort of top of his spine. And I remember everyone kept saying it, it was a line, everyone kept trotting it out. Well, anywhere else we would have just cut it out, but you can't go in there with scalpels. And that would get repeated like in family conversations where no one knew what to say because we hadn't had any experience of this kind of thing before. There's a lot, of, a lot of very strange things go on when someone dies, as you can imagine, or as someone's dying. But it really affected me you know i was just becoming a man really i was 16 uh i left home the following year so did my brother had already left home so my mother who'd gone from two kids and a husband and and being a housewife she'd suddenly gone to an empty house and was now in full-time work and It took me years to accept it. It took me years to accept it. I'm not going to blame anyone or any event in my life for the terrible mistakes I've made. And I've made a, a lot of sustained terrible mistakes. But without a doubt, having some, something so catastrophic happen had a lot to do with the choices and decisions I made afterwards. You know, I was writing my novel the other week and uh, there's this really quite beautiful story of when it was the middle of the summer holidays and my dad was self-employed. Um, oh no, at that time he worked in the foundry, so it must have been a weekend. He used to smelt bronze, you know, real man's job. I used to love it if ever I was too sick to go to school and he'd take me down there. And, you know, just burning metal and just sparks everywhere. I can smell it now, the smell of that that foundry and all like big sort of leather, hard, thick aprons and big gloves and a lot of injuries that no one seemed to care about. <laughs> and um, he was working up the shed, so I sort of pestered him. You know, I was about four or five. I pestered him. For some tools you know i just i wanted to be like my dad and my mum was sitting there drinking coffee and doing you know i don't know messing around with the plants and that and he gave me a hammer and some nails and a few bits of wood and he said to me he said why don't you make a sword make a sword and so you know my motor skills weren't great and i was just sort of hammering bang bang and just you know, and I'd go and show him and I'd have a little, look like a crucifix, really. And I'd be like, yeah, he'd go, yeah, OK, now, go. why don't you make a better one? Here's some other, well, just keeping me away from him while he worked. And he, he was up there all day, you know, I'd be running around in the garden. And these are glorious memories to me. I can see it exactly. We had, we had a very thin garden. It was about 13 foot across because so was the house. It was a two up, two down. But it was 100 foot long. And we had a pond and we had frogs every year. My dad actually made a canvas sailed windmill that powered the pond pump. And it, <laughs> in a tiny garden like that, it was quite the thing. And I can remember my mum taking him cups of coffee and that up there and them having a little chat and just, just loving it. Loving having my mum and dad there and being able to run around and have their attention and pester me old man occasionally and, and hear the noises up there and, and you know just watching him soaring and 
I can I can remember as a very young child being fascinated by adult males. You know, they're because I knew I was one of them, but I knew I was so different. I I, I realised that I'd become that, but it seemed so preposterous. You know, he had big big biceps and you know big shoulders and when he was soaring it the noise of it sounded so loud and aggressive and, and masculine and my little arms I could barely I could barely you know I couldn't do anything I was four I can remember fighting with my dad in the front room I was always fighting with him and I loved it and you know I think a lot of young boys will know this one when you fight you fight with your old man and they let you because it would be silly if they just threw you off and you, you know, you sort of grab, move in his arm. You think I've got him. You, you, you're convinced. You think I've got him. I've, I've got him. I've got him. And then, of course, when he's had enough, he just goes, and you, you just fly across the room. And I'd be giggling, and they'd be laughing. And I could smell the foundry on his clothes, and I could smell his sweat. And one of the strange things was, when my old man used to come back from the foundry, I'd smell the foundry, but I'd also smell this really strange, strong aroma that I thought was something to do with the foundry. When I was fighting him, occasionally I'd get a whiff of it. And it was only when I matured, and I was a late developer, very late, it was only when I was like, well, 16, and I finally had adult sweat, and it was identical to my father's. And it was, you know, it was, it was, it was bizarre. It was a, a real sort of connection you know, I'm made of the same stuff as my father. I'm made of the same blood. It's, uh, yeah, amazing. But anyway, so I'm, I'm sort of playing around in the garden. Glorious summer's day. Mum's there. The neighbours, we had these really old neighbours. Mrs Morris, she died when she was 84. And she'd be there and she'd bring me out sweets occasionally. And I remember, you know, she was proper old school. And I remember once she said to me, Oi, Chrissy, Chrissy, do you know what an oofum bird is? And my mum would go, Mrs. Morris, like sort of, you know, warning her to, to tread carefully. I was a kid. And I go, what's an oofum bird? And she went, sticks its head in the ground and whistles out its ass." <laughs> and of course, when you're four, that's the funniest thing in the world. And I was just running up and down the garden. My mum's got her head in her hands. We've got Nella and Joe one further down they were both in their 60s just just a wonderful little environment to grow up in you know everyone knew each other i've talked about the street before in you know in those days everyone's doors were open the front doors in the summer and as a kid i'd just walk into people's houses you just stroll in and they'd be like hello chris you're all right and i'll be like yeah sit on the sofa try and get a biscuit off them or a milkshake or something oh me that's taking a turn it's going down i can feel it Ooh. and um Really good times. And then at the end of that end of that day, my dad's come down from the shed. I, I remember seeing him shut the door, put the padlock on it, and he's walking down. And he went, oi. And I was sort of, yeah, dad wants me, dad wants me. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And out from behind his back, he pulled a sword. And it was about a metre and a half long with the, the bit that goes across here. I don't know what it's called. But all ornately carved, the actual saw wooden, you know, it wasn't going to cause any problems. But he'd carved it all and it was all proper joints, it wasn't just a hammered in. And that's what he'd been doing up there all day. He wasn't working, and this was his day off. And he, you know, he, he was distracting me with hammers and nails, go and make a sword. And he was up there making this beautiful wooden sword for me. And when I was writing in my novel the other day about that, I just burst out crying. And I'm not a crier. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, and I didn't think I would. You know, I'm quite cold, even when I'm writing about emotional stuff. And then when I just wrote about, I, I actually said in the novel, and he and something, something like he handed me the sword and it was the best day of my life. You know, I was four, I hadn't had many great days, but yeah, and it really struck me. And now, I'm nearly 50, I'm nearly 50 now, not a day goes, not a day goes by where I don't think about my father. Maybe not an hour. You know, my thinking is, 
is, is almost it's almost part of my critical thinking. It goes through him. What would he think? And it's not it's not a conscious thing. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not a conscious thing. It's just he's just sort of there. He's ever present. And when I meet people who've got fathers who, whose dads are still alive, which is most of my friends, and I see the frequently kind of disconnect between them, you know, there's no real conversation, there's, there's not much going on. And it's easy for me to say, of course, not having lost a father, weirdly, the bond has become stronger. An understanding of what a father is and what it means to you as a man has become more significant to me. And, you know, it, it's easier for that to happen because he's not actually there. But it's, it's kind of heartbreaking to see friends and their fathers and there's no... I think they don't, I, I feel like they don't understand how lucky they are. And there's no, there's no attempt to make use of what is really a gift. Well, you know, your father is there, your father is alive. There's conversations to be had there, there's a relationship there that needs to be developed. Not neglected, developed. I remember me and my best mate, we're, uh, there used to be, every year in Devon, in Totnes, just outside Totnes, there's a, there used to be a, every year a party just after mushroom season, which is key to the party. And it was called the Weirdos Ball. And they'd have a load of sort of psychedelic rock bands playing. Everyone would dress up and paint their faces in silly costumes. And everyone would be tripping. And me and my mate were tripping and we were in this sort of port affair both having a wee and sort of <laughs> and I said to him do you ever think about your dad when you're tripping and he fainted <laughs> he fainted on the spot it was like I went oi bang he just went oh. I said sorry mate <laughs> and after that after he come back up we didn't go there again but his relationship with his father is kind of naught. It's, 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 it's almost nothing. And I know what I'm talking about here is a kind of an impossibility because what I'm saying is when you've lost your father at an early age, you understand the significance of a father. So if you haven't, trust me and, and get busy. But if you haven't lost your father, I still don't think you understand that significance. So you won't be able to develop that relationship. It, it may, we may be, we may be condemned to, to a relationship of regret with fathers. It might, that might be how it works. But if, if I can offer anything, I think this is why I made this video. If you are lucky enough to have a father in your life, and I'm sure he sent you crazy, I'm sure he pisses you off. I'm sure there's times when you absolutely hate him. I mean, that's normal. I've said this before, hate is not opposite to love. Hate and love are part of the same thing. Opposed to love, you know, the binary opposite of love is indifference. You can't hate someone unless, unless you really care about them. It's, it's, it's kind of impossible to drum up that amount of, that, that kind of passion for someone if you've got no investment in them. But I urge you to make some effort. I urge you to, to you know, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting you sit down and get all psycho analytic on each other far from it but I would suggest you spend time together 
I would suggest that you talk to them and try and find out about them. And look, I'm sure there's some people watching this who've got great relationships with their father. And I'm sure there's some people watching this, fathers, who've got great relationships with their children. But I also know that, and I, I guess the majority of you, it's not the case. So if you're a father and you've got children, or if you're a child and you've got a father, don't take it for granted because it won't last forever. And it's very special. And I think, you know, as, as a culture, we, we don't really have adequate rituals to mark passings of time. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing when a man turns, when a boy turns into a man. You just kind of get on with it and get the piss taken out of you at school when you can't talk properly. And you get one hair come out here. And I think we also lack rituals between fathers and sons. And look, I'm, uh, this isn't, although this is all about men, it's because I'm a man. I'm not neglecting females here, but I can't speak too much about that. But there's no, real, there's no real bonding rituals that go on. And I think that's a terrible shame. You know, I think what we end up doing is seeking them in accidental events. You know, like that handing over of the sword. You know, it's kind of symbolic. <coughs> it's kind of symbolic for my father to do that. <coughs> what is happening here? Excuse me. <laughs> And I think, I think, I think when, when we lose our fathers, we start, that's when we start looking for the signification, the meaning, the moments where our lives, our lives between us counted for something profound. And I just urge you to perhaps consider being a little bit active in those profound exchanges that are possible between a father and a son. Yeah. 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 Yeah.